and why they think what they found is interesting and what the relevance may be. Um, so, um, perfect. Yeah. And uh, then also at the end, uh, Bettina Bessler. Hi, Bettina. Uh, the the co-host of the CMR Journal Club. Uh, she will then at the end also give a little preview on what we'll see next time. Okay, so welcome everybody uh, to today's CMR Journal Club. We are in the midst of the second wave. Uh, it looks like the world is just getting over the hump now uh, of the, the second wave, but in some areas, the number of deaths still are increasing. And in some uh, geographic regions, the, the healthcare system are at capacity. So I think uh, that that was uh, the reason to think about uh, new evidence on, on COVID, but not only that, but also the the partially triggered by some some papers that uh, provided quite provocative data on the the incidence and the severity of post COVID syndrome. So what is that? Why do some people suffer from fatigue, brain fog, but even shortness of breath, lack of physical activity, uh, uh, physical um, um, capabilities and, and fitness. So that was the reason for us to, to look at um, what's, what's out there. And there was this paper from the Oxford group and Betty Rahman uh, as the first author will present that paper here. And then we'll have also something very interesting. Uh, how do we assess patients with uh, suspected COVID? What's the protocol? And we're as CMR guys we're, uh, and girls, we're, we're mostly looking at the, the, the cardiac part, but of course the lungs are just right next to it. So I had already suggested that in, in, a, in a paper before and, and, and then we suggested that uh, from the SCMR side, or at least to consider to uh, um, also looking at the lungs. Now the lungs are typically not the prime target for MR. Most people are doing CT, but MR is a tool for visualizing lung pathology. So that's why I found this paper also interesting. Marco and Nicola uh, from Rome will address that. So without further ado, uh, Betty, take it from here and walk us through your paper. Thank you very much, very much, uh, Messias, and um, thank you everyone for attending this general club session. So my name is Betty. I'm a senior research fellow um, at OCMR, and um, myself and Professor Stefan Neubauer are leading um, the CMOR study, which uh, is a national effort to understand the prevalence of multi-organ injury in um, patients recovering from COVID-19. And this is the first paper that's come out of the preliminary work that we've done. So just starting uh, off with the background of um, what the rationale for this work. Well, we know that the effects of COVID-19 has been profound on, um, on the population. And back in March, when this study was conceived, there were, uh, there were data emerging uh, to suggest that patients with moderate to severe infection have evidence of uh, multi-organ injury on blood tests. Um, also around this time, there were some landmark papers, including a New England Journal paper from, um, from a group uh, in Holland where they showed that the virus may have an affinity for more than just uh, cells from the lungs, but also from uh, other organs. So it was proposed that multi-organ injury might be mediated by uh, viral, viral toxicity, uh, but other mechanisms have also been suggested, including um, an exaggerated and dysregulated immune response, thromboinflammation and coagulopathy. So our aim was to assess uh, firstly the prevalence of multi-organ injury uh, months after the acute infection, and then understand what the risk factors are and how this impacts on uh, the holistic uh, health of the individual, so mental health, cognition, as well as exercise tolerance. And the cohort that we uh, decided to study were um, survivors of moderate to severe infections um, at two to three months from disease onset. So this study was um, uh, approved by our local um, institutional ethics and registered um, at clinicaltrials.gov. 58 patients with moderate to severe laboratory confirmed COVID-19 were uh, enrolled in the study. And along with this, 30 uninfected controls were prospectively uh, recruited. The controls uh, had to be um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, antibody negative uh, and asymptomatic. So that was our way of saying that they were clearly uninfected. 
um, and um, they were sort of prospectively recruited and group matched for age, sex, body mass index, and um, risk factors. So cardiovascular risk factors as well as cerebrovascular risk factors. Um, so in terms of MRI, let's go back to, uh, so we undertook a multi-organ MRI scan, which uh, lasted for 70 minutes. Uh, we uh, assessed the brain, in particular we did, we undertook T1 weighted T, uh, imaging, T2 flare imaging, diffusion weighted imaging, uh, and susceptibility weighted imaging, and um, ASL to look at cerebral blood flow. For the lungs, uh, we only attempted a T2 weighted um, uh, case sequence, coronal and um, axial uh, images, and they were qualit qualitatively assessed by an experienced uh, radiologist. Cardiac assessment included um, cine imaging, T1 and T2 mapping, pulse contrast T1 mapping, and late gathering enhancement. We also assessed the liver uh, on a T1 map and T2 star mapping, and uh, similar sequences were, uh, um, so T1 mapping and T2 star mapping of the kidneys were also undertaken to assess inflammation and uh, oxygenation of the kidneys. The analysis was uh, undertaken in a blinded fashion um, and we had experts in each field analyzing the respective MR, uh, MRI images. Um, I, the details of this is, uh, is if people are interested, um, the details of the image analysis are in the uh, appendix of this uh, paper. The lung images were qualitatively assessed by our radiologist. The brain images were assessed using uh, pipelines uh, that are currently being used to analyze the UK Biobank brain image uh, images. And um, we used circle cardiovascular um, CVI-42 to assess the uh, cardiac uh, images. We have uh, an expert physicist who has also uh, who also helped us with analysis of liver, spleen, and kidney, kidney images. All patients also had um, spirometry to assess lung function, cardiopulmonary exercise test using a circle, uh, cycle ergometer, a six minute walk test, and a series of questionnaires to assess the extent of uh, depression symptoms, anxiety, as well as the quality of life uh, uh, scores in, in patients who are recovering from COVID-19. We specifically focused on symptoms of fatigue and breathlessness because at the time, March, April, when the study was conceived, we were looking at literature from SARS and MERS, and the symptoms that dominated in, in those cohorts were dyspnea and fatigue. So uh, we also undertook a few questionnaires to assess the burden of uh, ongoing breathlessness and fatigue in these patients. Uh, blood tests were, were, were performed, uh, including routine blood tests, uh, as well as markers of cardiac injury, BNP troponin, C-reactive protein, procalcitonin, um, and LDH. And Details of the uh, hospital admission were gathered from our electronic um, med medical records um, um, and fed into our electronic database. So before I go into the baseline characteristics, very briefly, our statistical analysis was quite simple. Uh, what, all we did was group comparisons between our COVID-19 patients and controls. Uh, we did not feel um, regression models would, would make sense with such small numbers. Uh, so the first report is really just a descriptive uh, report of any differences in the tissue abnormalities on MRI as well as blood biomarkers. We did not correct our comparisons uh, or um, tests for multiple comparison, and this remains a limitation of, of our work because we undertake a lot of comparisons in our study. So in terms of results, I start off with uh, the baseline demographics. Our COVID uh, cohort and control patients were well matched for age, uh, sex, body mass index, and cardiovascular as well as cerebrovascular risk factors. Uh, the only difference was that there were more people uh, in the COVID-19 group who were of uh, Black or Asian descent um, uh, and belonged to the minority ethnic groups. Um, there were some differences in vital signs at follow-up. So our COVID patients were slightly tachycardic, had a high temperature, low oxygen saturation, and um, slightly increased respiratory rate. Just some more details on the characteristics of our COVID group. Um, a third of our patients required um, or had been admitted to ICU. So we had a moderately sick group. 
And um, again, a similar proportion of patients uh, right below where it's a CPAP and intubation, a similar proportion were, uh, were ventilated. Uh, and this is quite important, particularly when we're considering um, the lung findings in the study. 3% uh, of our patients received renal re uh, replacement therapy and about 7% inotropic support. And a third were managed with steroids um, in, in our cohort. So moving on to system specific findings. Um, so, in, so when we looked at the uh, lung recovery, uh, so 93% of our patients had abnormal radiological findings due, uh, in the lungs on admission. At two to three months, we found that on MRI, just T2 haste imaging, 60% uh, had uh, abnormalities uh, that were detected by the expert radiologist. 64% of our patients continue to have uh, symptoms of breathlessness and 55% fatigue. And when we looked at lung function uh, results, uh, patients with COVID-19 had reduced FEV1 and FVC, and the ratio was mildly increased, almost in keeping with a restrictive picture. What about exercise tolerance? Uh, COVID-19 patients had a significantly reduced six minute walk distance and measures of exercise capacity on, ex uh, on cardiopulmonary exercise testing, including peak VO2, VEVCO2, which is a ventilatory equivalent of carbon dioxide and oxygen uptake efficiency were reduced in our COVID-19 patients. Of interest, at least a third of our patients had a submaximal test because they stopped uh, due to symptoms of breathlessness and fatigue to suggest that deconditioning was playing an important role in exercise limitation in survivors. And we also saw an association between exercise parameters and blood biomarkers of inflammation, including CRP, white cell count, and procalcitonin. So what about the neurological findings? Um, so Qualitative assessment of our brain scans by the neuroradiologist did not reveal any group differences in the prevalence of small vessel disease, white matter hyperintensities, hemorrhage, or ischemic changes. But um, advanced quantitative analysis that was undertaken um, in Oxford by the UK Biobank experts actually uh, revealed that there were changes on quantitative measures. Uh, in, in particular, T2 star signal was increased uh, in the uh, thalami in the brain. Um, and mean diffusivity, which suggests the microstructural damage was, uh, was abnormal in the uh, posterior thalamic radiation as well as the surgical stratum. So there are some structural abnormalities in these uh, survivors who did not necessarily uh, have neurological symptoms. So what about our cardiac? Um, uh, so just briefly, we also undertook cognitive assessment. And although the mean cognitive, uh, the median cognitive score did not differ between our COVID and controls, um, we found that uh, patients who were recovering from COVID did have um, a, an impairment in the executive and visuospatial domain, which uh, is usually affected by, sub by vascular events. So this was an interesting finding. And we also, we also observed uh, as with some of the other MRI parameters that periventricular white matter hyperintensity in the brain, uh, which is an imaging biomarker for cognitive decline, was associated with markers of inflammation. So moving on to cardiac health, which is uh, probably the, the most interesting part of the study for the group here today. Um, our, so our cohort differs from a number of other published cohorts in the sense that we um, only about three out of 58 patients had an elevated troponin. So these were predominantly patients who were not um, unwell from a cardiac point of view during their admission. And certainly on follow-up, none of them had an elevated troponin um, and, and only one had slightly borderline abnormal BNP. So um, on cardiac MRI, left ventricular and right ventricular function were both normal in our COVID-19 cohort. Um, and when we looked at the tissue abnormalities, specifically T1 and T2, the marker that stood out was T1. So what we observed was that uh, base and mid ventricular T1 were significantly elevated in our COVID-19 co cohort. 26% had an abnormal uh, T1 in the base and 8% in the mid and 24% when we averaged the base and, and mid ventricle. But um, to our surprise, native T1 uh, sorry, native T2 was not significantly different between the two groups. 
I'm just going to take it on too. Um, and, and when we looked at fibrosis, both as extracellular volume and late gadolinium, ECV, there was a numerical difference, but this didn't reach statistic, statistical significance, but focal fibrosis was mildly increased uh, in our COVID-19 cohort compared to controls. We also did a qualitative assessment of late GAD patterns, and there were no difference in the uh, pathological patterns versus physiological patterns between the, between the COVID-19 and control group. So um, the proportion of people with myocardi myocarditic pattern of late GAD were more or less similar between our COVID-19 and um, matched controls. What about liver findings? So 30% of our patients had abnormal uh, liver function tests on admission. Uh, at follow-up, this uh, improved to 10%, and on MRI, further 11% had abnormal liver T1. Uh, liver T, iron corrected liver T1 is, uh, is a biomarker of hepatic fiber inflammation, and this was, as with other imaging biomarkers, was seen to moderately associate with markers of inflammation in our uh, COVID-19 survivors. And when we looked at uh, blood abnormalities such as lymphocytopenia and thrombocytopenia, which were moderately prevalent on admission, a number of these abnormalities resolved. C-reactive protein also improved. However, there, were, um, there was a tendency to an increased CRP in our survivors compared to controls. We also assessed the splenic volume and tissue characteristics of the spleen to see if there were any differences, and, and there was none. Another interesting finding in our study were uh, the MRI abnormalities on, uh, on assessment of the uh, kidneys. So Eddie, we, have only, we have only one or two minutes left, please. Sure, um, yeah, just... sure. So, uh, um, okay. so we observed that 30% or 29% of our patients had abnormal uh, renal T1, uh, as well as a loss of cardiomedullary differentiation. And these abnormalities, in particular T1, associated with markers of inflammation. And um, we then looked at the association of multiple organ abnormalities on MRI and mental health. And there was no association uh, with symptoms of depression, although a third, almost a third of patients had moderate to severe symptoms of uh, depression and anxiety. Finally, what was the link between the severity of disease during the hospital admission and markers of inflammation? So there was a moderate association. Um, and that brings me to the key messages from this paper, which are highlighted at the top of this discussion. So the first thing to say was um, in this largely asymptomatic group of COVID-19 survivors, we found that a proportion of people had um, displayed abnormalities on MRI involving the lungs, brain, heart, liver, and kidneys. And the severity of acute illness during admission correlated with markers of multi-organ injury, but also markers of inflammation. Although we did not see an association between mood symptoms or cognition and structural changes on MRI, there was a significant burden of um, anxiety and depressive symptoms in our survivors. And so to summarize, we have, um, we have suggested that in managing patients who are recovering from COVID-19, um, we ought to take a multidisciplinary approach uh, to ensure that you know, we address all the concerns of, of our patients. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for those who want to ask questions, just uh, put them into the chat uh, box or just unmute yourself and uh, identify yourself. and. Uh, so, first of all, thank you very much. And while we will not have the time now to, to discuss in more detail, there are a few, I think, interesting aspects. First of all, it's uh, sort of good news that even in a hospitalized population, uh, the proportion of patients with um, uh, severe cardiac uh, problems seem to have been relatively small. However, I say relatively, compared to some previous papers that may be outliers, but, but uh, that reported a much higher incidence of persisting uh, edema and such. And that, of course, this all, uh, all this discussion um, probably sometimes uh, ignores that uh, any, if you take a, a random cross-sectional cohort, you will have patients uh, or participants with some damage in the myocardium because we use a very, very sensitive method. 
So some of them may have fibrosis, some of them may have may have unrecognized MI. So that's not negligible. That's certainly one factor. And then the other factor is, of course, what is the population we're looking at? And you had a population with a relatively small proportion, only three patients had a positive troponin. So they, they were not, the, due to whatever reason, they were not the, the patients that, that were severely affected uh, in their cardiovascular system right in, in the hospital. So um, when we look at also the overall, what we know already, the, probably the, the proportion of patients with viral myocarditis, so with typical necrotic myocarditis, is probably relatively small. We, we don't have a lot of data indicating that we see that we see a lot of that, but we see more often than we should, I think, see persisting T2, persisting T1, and you also found that. Uh, the question, of course, that I have is, okay, what if that happens after any viral disease? And we just didn't know, we just didn't follow them. We have some data in viral myocarditis, but, but maybe after a severe systemic viral inflammation, especially one that, that affects, maybe we see that more often. That's one aspect. Another aspect that is like maybe even more important is that uh, the coronavirus, uh, the SARS coronavirus too, enters the cell through the ACE2 receptor. The ACE2 receptor is also involved in regulating blood pressure and vascular permeability. So it may be that knocking out this receptor leads to an increased vascular permeability, and especially in patients with hypertension, who we know are at higher risk, that leads to more extravasation, more edema, and then to, to these findings. Now, you didn't find a lot of T2, um, uh, so, so uh, that, that we also have to learn more about that. But the question I have to you, and then we'll have to move on, um, Betty, uh, or, um, uh, there, there are also questions in the chat. Maybe Betty, you can answer them uh, directly then uh, after that. But the question I have to you directly, if you look at all you have seen, the different organ systems, what would you be mostly afraid of after COVID? Would you be more concerned about your lungs, your kidneys, your, your mental status, your cardiovascular status? What do you think is what, what may affect us most, at least based on your uh, experience? Yeah, no, that's, that's an excellent question. I have to say that my, um, based on the work that I've done, the biggest fear is renal, um, renal damage. Um, and it, it sounds absurd for a cardiologist to be saying this, but that's because um, when, I mean, if I could just share, um, you know, very quickly, uh, just, to, just to give a pictorial representation of what we've seen, and this is actually in the appendix for people who are interested. Um, so what we're seeing in the kidney is, can you see the slide? Yeah, but please keep it very short. We yeah, have yeah, to yeah, sure. So, so on, on the, on the, uh, so at the bottom of the right corner, so on the left yeah. is the, uh, is a control. You can see the cortical, the, the differentiation between the cortex and the medulla is quite clear. Uh, there's good C uh, cortical medullary differentiation on the T1 is in the cortex is in the normal range. And on the right is our COVID patient. And we can see a loss of cortical medullary differentiation. This was seen in 30% of our patients. And if you look at a, a recent paper that's come out, six month follow-up of, um, yeah. of COVID-19 patients, uh, at least a third of patients with normal GFR on uh, admission were seen to develop new onset renal, renal injury. So the subclinical damage that has occurred that wasn't detected by creatinine and GFR on admission. Um, and, and interestingly, you know, sensitive MRI techniques are detecting that. Um, so that's something that I would be, I think the heart has got quite a bit of reserve, uh, at least that's my opinion, <laughs> but I, I'm not so confident about the kidney. Thank you very much. If you, you could unshare your screen so that uh, oh. Nicola and Marco can jump in. So Nicola, uh, Marco, I'm very sorry that we went stepped on over time. So we'll, we'll have to add an extra five minutes. Uh, so yeah. you will talk about your protocol uh, or a sort of protocol suggestion for a cardiothoracic uh, MRI. And, uh, and of course, that is important uh, because it may, in the hospital, save an extra scan. And so that's why I think it's a brilliant idea to think about that. So take it from here. Yes, thank you very much, Matthias. And uh, good afternoon, because I'm, we are talking from Rome and it's, let's say, mid-afternoon still day. So good afternoon to all, almost 100 colleagues connected. Uh, my name is Marco Francona, I'm from Rome and I asked to uh, support me in the short presentation of our protocol, Nicola Galea, who is the first author and corresponding author of this article we published uh, late December 
in European art journal. As Matthias mentioned, the rationale of this uh, basically and the story of this paper started during the first wave of pandemic that you know started earlier in Italy. Uh, during March, we had uh, an outbreak probably after China, Italy was the first country in the world having this huge, uh, this tremendous attack. And we were really uh, counting our patients, uh, trying to understand what was going on. And of course the heart was not the, the center of the problem. And even the well-known embolic complications uh, were initially underestimated. Uh, we are radiologists and just to give you an overview initially, we didn't use contrast to, to assess this patient, which can be very useful uh, because of the high risk of thrombotic complications. So why this long introduction? Because our idea, we are doing a lot of cardiac MR studies, of course, was to uh, try to combine the uh, extraordinary comprehensiveness of MR. We have heard a lot in different settings in COVID-19 patients. And uh, we meant to look at three different aspects. Of course, myocardial injury, because it was pretty clear since the beginning or probably after one month, of uh, since the beginning of the pandemic that heart was a target. We had these patients with newly onset arrhythmias, myocarditis, um, uh, Minoka syndromes, et cetera, et cetera. And CMR uh, requires, uh, popped up to us, but we also wanted to combine the evaluation of lungs and uh, finally the evaluation of pulmonary vessels because the third and very common set of complications regard uh, pulmonary thromboembolic complications. So this is basically what we discussed in the background of, uh, of this article. Uh, we were, of course, using uh, extremely uh, frequently CT because CT is the gold standard for chest evaluation. And of course, it's also, to me, the gold standard for uh, PE uh, evaluation. But of course, MR is giving a lot of excellent results in this specific setting. Uh, let me just rapidly address the clinical indications and the criteria for patient selection that we are we have rather expanded after almost one year of experience. And then I asked Nicola to proceed with the protocol because it was his idea to set up this uh, two protocols, one longer and one shorter. The clinical indications as shown here regard the patients with high sensitive troponin T levels, uh, the presence of newly onset LD dysfunction of uncertain etiology at fast, at fast bed psychocardiography, and finally the presence of an infant-like clinical presentation in patients with non-obstructive coronary artery disease at uh, coronary angiography, so whatever we would call as Minoka syndrome. So please, Nicola, you can proceed uh, and present your protocol uh, and guide me through the screen. I will be your hands in remote. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Marco, it's, and thank it's you. It's not a, a beautiful image, but you have to accept <laughs> that I'm using my hands for you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Matthias, for, uh, um, for this invitation. Uh, our proposal was to modify the traditional, the conventional protocol to assess the, the cardiac injury uh, implemented uh, by the sequence for evaluation of the uh, lung, parenchyma, and the, the pulmonary uh, artery uh, tree. In particular, we conceived two kinds of different protocol. One is a longer protocol, uh, a standard protocol that uh, is based basically on the uh, standard this, our standard CMR protocol that rely on the uh, acquisition of a, a steer, a steer sequence for the uh, assessment of the myocardial edema, uh, obviously the acquisition of native T1 and uh, T2 mapping, and after uh, gadolinium injection, the acquisition of uh, CINE uh, MR imaging uh, late enhancement and uh, post contrast uh, uh, T1 mapping to generate extra cellular volume fraction um, map. But uh, uh, starting from this basic uh, standard protocol of the, for the conventional CMR, we add some sequence for evaluation of the uh, lung parenchyma. In particular, uh, before starting with the um, uh, acquisition of uh, dedicated uh, cardiac plants, we acquired um, a, fast, uh, a fat saturation, uh, proton density weighted uh, sequence, respiratory triggered uh, for uh, um, evaluate the presence of uh, um, um, 
of, of uh, uh, lung uh, parenchyma uh, consolidation. And uh, we had also uh, our short sequences uh, around uh, three minutes, no more, of uh, respiratory triggered uh, DVI sequence uh, because we found this uh, a particular sequence useful to assess the activity the, of the inflammation of the consolidation. So uh, for, uh, in the first sequence, we used to detect consolidation and uh, pleural effusion. The second one, the DVI, please, Marco, um, uh, zoom out yes. for the yeah. images, thank you, and uh, to uh, assess also the activity of the disease. Uh, during the contrast injection, we prefer to uh, change the um, acquisition that we often, especially in this patient when uh, they, um, we can have the uh, uh, potential suspicious of uh, an inflammation of myocardium, so uh, myocarditis, for example, we prefer to change, to uh, replace the traditional early announcement sequence with a, um, a first pass MR angiography to assess the pulmonary artery, because uh, as we well know, uh, there is an increased risk of a pulmonary embolism in this patient. Uh, this uh, scheme, uh, this uh, um, uh, protocol was especially uh, conceived at the beginning of the um, of the. Uh, COVID period when uh, there is a lot of evidence about uh, the increased uh, presence of a thromboembolism in this patient. At the end, uh, we found very uh, few patient the presence of uh, embolism. And when the, um, the risk was, uh, the clinical risk was high, uh, obviously we direct this patient to the uh, acquisition of a C uh, to, uh, to rule out the pulmonary embolism. Uh, when the patient was poorly uh, cooperative or has is dyspnoic and we cannot um, uh, obtain a complete exam, we had to shorten, to optimize the acquisition of the sequence. We try to uh, reduce the number of the acquired sequence uh, to the minimal necessary to, uh, uh, to detect uh, the, the presence of a, a cardiac injury or a lung injury. And uh, for example, um, uh, we use this uh, fast protocol. So a fast protocol uh, is uh, less uh, sensitive to uh, the um, briefing artifact. And for this reason, we uh, just acquired a trophy, a trophisp, uh, a brief all the trophisp is very uh, fast uh, sequence with a two, uh, um, two um, dimensional um, uh, single shot acquisition with the true FISP sequence, uh, acquiring all uh, thorax and the axial view and the coronal view uh, to assess the presence of, uh, um, of um, consolidation, obviously, and effusion. And then we acquired the uh, native T1 and T2 maps just to assess the presence of uh, uh, myocardial injury. Uh, probably due to edema. Uh, also using what, what is the recently proposed um, uh, criteria for uh, detect the presence of uh, myocarditis in the, uh, in, the, in the consensus document published from uh, the uh, SCMR. Um, and then we uh, obviously acquired the CNMR. If at the end of this uh, fast protocol, we uh, found any signs of uh, myocardial inflammation, like an increase of, anti of uh, T1 or T2 uh, values, then we proceed with the acquisition of uh, uh, the post-GAD sequence, uh, LG, and uh, obviously ECV map. Or if we have some uh, suspicions of uh, um, pulmonary embolism, we acquired also the um, pulmonary MRA. And uh, I, I, we think that the, the most, uh, the, 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 the great uh, value of this uh, paper is uh, the possibility to optimize the um, diagnostic value of, of MRI, not only uh, limi uh, limiting uh, to the cardiac uh, um, um, uh, evaluation, but also extending to the other uh, other, uh, obviously, ob other organs. It is in particular important because in this patient, um, obtain a CT evaluation of the lung parenchyma and the uh, pulmonary artery is, compli is, uh, is, is complicated, not only uh, from uh, uh, the possibility to, uh, to organize, but also from obviously the infection uh, risk 
to uh, mobilize, to move the patient to this infection of the session of the CT uh, unit. Uh, so if in some of these patients we can avoid, for example, a repeated CT scan to uh, monitor um, the evaluate the, the, the progression of the lung uh, condition, or uh, we can uh, rule out in some patient the uh, CTA when uh, uh, there the was negative the uh, magnetic resonance angiography. So, uh, the, in our opinion, the value of this uh, proposed uh, protocol is the possibility to optimize the use of the, 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 the diagnostic value of the MRI in these uh, specific settings. Okay. I think, thank you so much, Nicola, nothing much to add. We won't get too much into details of the results because uh, it was mainly a feasibility study, Matthias. So of course, if you went through the paper, you would see that mostly we found myocarditis, of course, but also it was interesting to look at the nature of pulmonary consolidation and the activity of disease. So for us being radiologists with chest experience, uh, we found uh, an added value uh, of MR to look at the lungs, which is very uncommon because we never do MR of the lungs. And that's the basic message to yeah. deliver also to the cardiology community, that yeah. we can use it really uh, comprehensively in this very complicated disease. Yeah, and, uh, just uh, brief. Uh, 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 sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so just a, a, a very brief comments. Obviously, in this little experience, because it's just uh, uh, less than twenty patients, we can confirm the the large heterogeneity of the uh, cardiac involvement in these kind of patients. So we found patients with a myocardial, myocardial infection, with a myocarditis, with a pericarditis, with uh, just an uh, uh, increase of uh, T2 value. This is obviously is subject of uh, uh, more extended uh, studies, but uh, I, I think is uh, uh, another very interesting uh, uh, finding of this, uh, this, uh, this kind of a preliminary experience. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think it's a it's a it's a very good idea. Again, we're unfortunately over time. There are some uh, questions in the in the chat if you if you want to uh, answer them. Um, I think the to me a very important takeaway is yes, it's possible to assess the lungs. Uh, of course, we all know that CT is the prime modality for a lung and that for the lungs, and that will not change. But we know while MR is not good at showing a, a healthy lung because so much air is in there with all the trouble associated with that. Pathology is actually not that bad. So if you have pathology, MR is quite sensitive. And, uh, and so I think it makes a lot of sense, especially if it doesn't significantly prolong the protocol to add that because it may save this patient a, an extra uh, scan. Okay, um, uh, if there are not any other pressing questions, I think in the inter interest of time, uh, I just want to, uh, end it before I send uh, Anya, uh, you all back uh, just with um, pointing to a, a symposium that we're having this because there was also one question about bold and breathing uh, symposium uh, the McGill offers. We already also have more than 100 attendees here on oxygenation sensitive CMR with, for diagnosing cardiovascular disease. And we have talks from uh, several countries and uh, I will post um, the, the link uh, in, the, in the chat um, so you will find it until the, the this closes, and if not, then send us an email and we'll uh, look at that. Now we'll hand over to Bettina uh, after thanking you all for attending and uh, especially uh, Betty, Nicola and Marco for the, for the excellent presentation. Stay well and, and stay healthy. Bettina, take Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank well. you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you also from my side. This was really very interesting. Um, so I'd like to announce the next um, drill club, which will take place on March 3. Um, and we will have two talks uh, about myocarditis again, so my favorite topic. Um, one bit more technical talk about 3D whole heart uh, T2 mapping, and one bit more clinical um, talk uh, about checkpoint inhibitor associated myocarditis, which is a very interesting topic, I think. So. Um, yes, I'm happy to welcome you again on March 3 and um, stay healthy. And thank you all for joining us today and for the nice presentation.